feeds very tremendously in nutrient content. In about 2,500 samples of alfalfa hay that our lab has analyzed in the last few years, the protein level varied from 9.6 to 24.5 percent. The average for these samples was about 18 percent. The question is, if you didn't analyze your own hay, which value for protein would you use for alfalfa hay? The reason that it's important to know the nutrient content of your feeds is because it's the nutrients that allow animals to gain as you want them to do. Animals use nutrients such as protein, energy, calcium, phosphorus, vitamins and minerals for the productive purposes. They can get these nutrients from a variety of different feedstuffs, but knowing the level in the feedstuffs you're using will allow you to provide what the cattle need. Cattle are kind of like your own car. A car requires the nutrients of, of gas, oil, air pressure in the tires and so on to get you where you want to go. Nutrients are required by the animals to get them where you want them to be, to get the gain that's required on, for example, a feedlot steer. Obviously, there are some things we can tell about the quality of hay just by looking at it. On the outside of this bale, we can see there's some discoloration evident, and if we look closely, there's a few signs of mold and dust. Um, on the inside of the bale, however, we do have some pretty good quality feed at least something that looks to be of good quality. The color is, is nice and green, it's dry, there's no obvious signs of mold or dust. However, even with our visual appraisal and even smelling this product, we're not able to tell what its nutrient content would be. We're not able to tell how useful this hay would be to animals when they fed on it. And as a result, we have to rely on chemical methods to give us those, that kind of information. If the protein level in the forage used to background these cattle was, say, 9%, then without supplementation, the cost of gain during that period would probably rise from 47 to maybe 60 cents per pound. With supplementation, we're able to achieve the target weight at the end of the feeding period and get a marketable product that we're shooting for. On a group of 100 head, this could amount to as much as $3,500 difference between having a low protein feed, not supplemented, or spending a little bit of money supplementing it. When sampling hay, it's certainly possible to get some material to send into the lab. By grabbing it like that, we certainly do lose some leaves. And therefore, we're not actually getting a good representative sample of what the animal, in fact, would be eating. The only way to sample baled forage is with the use of a probe. I've got two probes here. This is the industry standard called the Penn State Forage Probe and another newer model made locally called the Star Quality Sampler. To get a good representative sample it's essential to use a probe of this nature. Now I'm going to use one of these samplers and actually sample the bales here in front of us. It's important to take about 15 to 20 individual cores from about that many bales. Again, remember that the lab that you send this sample to is only going to be using probably 50 to 60 grams of the material in their chemical tests. So you want to make sure that is definitely representative of the amount of feed you're hoping it to be. It's important that you don't just sample the bales that are easy to get to. And you also have to realize that this is going to take a little bit of work and effort. If this information is going to be of use to you, then this is a pretty critical stage in the whole process. As a nutritionist, I'd rather have no information to work with than inaccurate information when I'm formulating a feeding program for a client. 
it's very important that you don't let the sample get contaminated with snow or dirt on the outside edge of a bale. So keep your sample as clean as possible and get as many samples from as many bales, preferably 15 to 20, to do a good job of selecting your representative sample. When sampling stored grain, you should avoid taking the sample at the door. This is where light grain settles out and you won't be fair to your own feed. We recommend that you use a grain probe to sample right to the core of the bin, or preferably take the sample at the time of filling. Looking at silage, we have two problems. One is you can only sample going in or going out. The other part is you have to get a good representative sample of the silage. If you're sampling going in, you have to rely on the fact that you're going to have a good solid fermentation process in either the upright or the pit silage. If you're sampling on the way out, there's a time factor involved, and depending on which lab you go to, the difference can be three days to three weeks for return on the silage. When you're sampling a uh, pit silo, it's important to sample across and up and down on the face of the silage pit. It's important to dig away the material that is dry and get into the two representative samples inside the pit. That way you know you're getting what's actually in the pit. Results from a mixed feed sample cannot be used to create a balanced ration. However, a sample of mixed feed can be used to verify a ration or to check the efficiency of a mixing system. It's important to feed test early so that you can get your farm management plan in place. All for ration balancing, purchasing supplements, or even the sale of hay is important. Feed allocation is also a concern, whether you're just wintering cows or calving them or in a dairy situation. It's important to sample hay for individual analysis of different feedstocks, and it opens the window as to what's actually inside the bale. Once you've worked hard and taken your good representative sample, you want to immediately identify that so you don't lose track of, of the sample through the rest of the process. These bags can be written on as can any plastic bag if you have the right type of marker. It's important to get a good seal on your package, of course to keep the sample from leaking out, but also to keep air out and also to keep from losing moisture content. It's extremely important to package a silage sample properly. The first thing I usually do is pack it well to exclude the unwanted air. After it's packed in the bag, of course, it should be sealed immediately. And double bagged. Unwanted air will cause the silage to heat during shipment to the lab or give us an untrue dry matter determination. If the silage sample cannot be delivered immediately to the lab, it should go into the freezer and be frozen solid. It then should be delivered to the lab in the cold condition. As with any sample, it's important to immediately identify it so you know when you get your results back exactly what sample you're working with. The analysis that should be requested of the lab varies with the type of sample you've got. The minimum analysis recommended for a forage would be moisture, fiber, protein, calcium and phosphorus, and if it's a silage, pH as well. 
This will give your nutritionist basic information necessary to do a good job of formulating rations for your cattle. If it's a grain sample, moisture, protein, and phosphorus are all that is required. Other analysis that are available from your lab can be used to help your nutritionist or your veterinarian diagnose problems with productivity or with health in your herd. However, these should not be routinely requested unless you have the advice of a professional that they are required. Pat, there's several points that should be emphasized in summary. First and foremost is the fact that we need a good representative sample of that feed if the downstream benefits are to be realized. That means using a forage probe or baled forages, uh, taking 15 to 20 samples from a grain or from a silage pit, and also handling and identifying those samples properly before they even get to the lab. So there's a lot of things there the farmer can do to ensure his investment. Yes, I agree. We can look at nutrient value. We can use this for feed uh, planning for upcoming winter. We can also use it for setting the value of the hay if we plan to sell it. I think it's important also to emphasize the fact that people who make good use, who make money from feed testing, don't necessarily know a lot about nutrition. They don't have to know about nutrition, but they do have to know where they can find help in making this, uh, this tool work for them. That's right. This is a crystal ball we can use to look inside the feed and see what's there.